yeah, he wasn't too keen on the lotus birth idea, but you know, she really felt passionate about it and she managed to get the first lotus birth by a C-section there awesome. and everybody was just so Which intrigued. hospital is this? St. Vincent's. Yeah, so private <laughs> hospital and yeah, all the midwives were coming in and asking her about it and there was this big thing of that the cord had stayed attached and you know, they all <laughs> talked about how he was always holding his cord and how content he looked with his placenta being there. So I think it's really beautiful and a lot of education would have come through that. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to go back a little bit to what I think happens with the energy transfer. Um, you know, I have a little bit of a theory that we talk a lot about our family tree. And so being that there's a tree in the placenta, I feel that it has something to do with healing our family lineage. Uh, yeah, so... Epigenetics, mm. perhaps, on an epigenetic level. Yeah, and I think about. that we are, you know, some of us can be born, and this is sort of going into a whole other level of stuff, obviously, but as we know, we can carry trauma that's been held throughout our family. So originally, as an egg, we were in our grandmother's womb because when our, she was pregnant with our mother, yeah. we were already in our mother's womb. So yes. when you look at it from that perspective, whatever our grandmother was carrying and experiencing, we already have that within us. Yep. And so often you find, if you do go on this type of healing journey, you'll find that things that come up for you aren't just yours, it's to do with your family history. Yep. And so I do feel that the placenta, as I said, having that tree, having the looking at it from a family tree perspective, I do feel like there's some sort of like ancestral healing coming through with that and it's as the energy transfers across on a spiritual level it's working through a lot of things that that baby is then not going to have to work through in their life and things are going to be a lot easier mm -hmm. and a lot of parents are talking about their lotus children as they're growing up and people ask me what's the difference between Marley and the other kids and there's just, there's so much difference, but it's it's very subtle. Uh, so it's you know it's just her awareness, it's the energy in her eyes, it's how strong she is, and it's like she just has this really strong buffer around her, and yeah, she's just full of life and all how that. healthy and is she? Very healthy, yeah. <laughs> and you know the other children, uh, as as strong as they are in their own way, it's. Yeah, it's it's different. It's hard to put into words because it's, it's talking about that energy level. Mm. Um, just going back to what you were saying before about why did the umbilical cord get cut in the first place? Well, from what I've read, it seems that it went back to a time in the 19th century when women were giving birth in their own home and the wealthy women had male servants, male and female servants. Now, some of these servants were around when the childbirth was taking place, and it was also their job to clean the sheets afterwards. So they were finding that there was an awful lot of blood appearing on the sheets, which meant a lot of hard work for them to get rid of it. So they decided, oh, well, if we, if we clamp and then cut a little while later, there won't be as much blood on the sheets for us to clean. So that is actually how it commenced. Mm. There is not any scientific research or evidence to say that, um, that it serves any good purpose whatsoever. Mm. And now we've learnt what we know. We know that it, it um, isn't serving any good purpose for the baby. Yep. So far better for them to have their blood. Mm. Yeah, because I was going to ask about um, the risks and the benefits, obviously, of lotus birth, um, but it seems like, from what you said, there's a lot more risks in clamping and cutting the cord rather than keeping it intact. <laughs> um, do you want to say anything on that? Yeah. And in lotus birth, there are no risks. Mm. There's never been a noted case of infection. Yep. Often women will be told from the obstetricians or, you know, the medical industry, they'll say, no, 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 your baby will get an infection. You say, an infection yep. from what? Yeah. 
It's, it's, it's not an open wound, actually. They're more likely to get an infection from creating that open wound. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess the only thing to be mindful of if you do lotus birth is the cord dries very quickly, mm. like within the first 24 hours, and how it dries, it kind of stays stiff. So you want it to dry in a good position. But I think you could soak it in water just to soften it again you to can. move it a little bit. Yeah, because yeah. it's the only bit that can be a little bit tricky is, mm. you know, manoeuvring the cord. And... I was going to ask I was gonna ask about the practicality of having this placenta attached to the baby yeah. <laughs> for days after birth. Like, how do you breastfeed? How do you sleep? How do you transport? Do you, you know, if you put your baby in the car seat, I'm assuming you just put the placenta next to it, you know. Yeah, you certainly can. You can just wrap the placenta up and sit it on the baby. So there's been a story noted of a woman who wanted to lotus birth and didn't want to tell her family because she knew there would be a bit of adverse reactions, yeah. which happens. And so she just sat the placenta on the baby and wrapped the baby up in a blanket and everyone held the baby and the baby got passed around and no one had any idea that the placenta mm. was on the baby. That's funny. Yeah, so you you um, to dress the baby, I used outfits that had the buttons at the front so yeah. that I could feed the cord through yeah. the hole. I've had a mum say she would use the sleeping bags next time so she could just put the placenta in the sleeping bag and then... Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. carry the baby around as one. Yeah. Generally, most people will sit the placenta in a bowl okay. next to the baby and yeah you can pick up your baby and the bowl and walk around yeah. but ideally when you're lotus birthing unless you need to come home from the hospital you're not going to get in the car you're not going to go walking yeah. out to the supermarket you're going to be at home and some people use steamers the um the asian steamers the rice steamer okay bamboo Oh, yeah, yeah, to sit the placenta in. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you can decorate it, you could salt it. So mm. I salted mine every 24 hours, and then we just went in the bathroom and rinsed it off under cold water, okay, so you don't want to use warm or hot water yep. for um, to wash it off. Some mums like to make bags while they're pregnant. Yeah. They um, sew a lovely little placenta bag. Yeah, and you can buy those online as well. You can buy herbs to put on it and lime you could use you know any herbs i guess yep. just research what you want to do with it yeah my daughter used to go and pick a flower every day and bring it in and we'd sit that on the placenta every day yep. awesome um and after the placenta um detaches from the baby what do people generally do then with the placenta um generally the placenta gets buried yep. in back into mother earth yep. um the parents have received a wonderful gift. This beautiful baby has come into this world. So what we do is bury the placenta to give thanks. Now this is an ancient custom that's taken place for thousands and thousands of years by many, many different cultures all around the world. Um, <clears throat> but of course in Australia we've had hospital birth for the last 160 years. I was going to say every culture except the medical one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, so for, yeah, for the last 160 years. So, um, I don't know, where am I at now? What am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what do we do with the placenta after that? Oh, the yeah, that's touches? right. That's right. So, um, I, I suggest to people that they that they have a, a lovely little ceremony yep. for the burial. Now, not everybody wants to do that. Yep. Sometimes they just want to do a little private ceremony themselves, mm. just the mum and dad and members of the family. Yeah. Some people like to bury it in the ground and plant a tree over the top, which we think is lovely because it is the tree of life. Mm. So it's beautiful yep. if it's feeding another tree so that you have... The two trees yeah cool. <laughs> it's um yeah like the celtic tree and um yeah so a, a little ceremony i think what we did with um yours michelle i think where there was a little tree out the front and we turned that into a wishing tree didn't we and all the children um tied little ribbons and uh made wishes for for marley for for her Aww. life Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, that was part of her ceremony. I actually planted succulents over the top of Marley's placenta because we were just renting and I knew that it was possible to move yep. one day. Uh, a lot of people will put it in a large pot because mm. they want to 
well, I guess the same situation yeah. they're renting and they know they're going to move. For me, I, I felt that I really wanted to put it into the earth. Yeah. Uh, yeah, again, there's more history into putting, you know, even humans into the earth and yeah. things like that. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting that you both said that because after um, my birth of my daughter, I actually buried my placenta as well. I didn't have yeah. a lotus birth. Good yeah. for but you. It's so interesting yeah. that That's maybe good. it's just an instinct. It, it is, is instinctive. Yeah. It is. I had this yep. ceremony with my, my brothers and yeah. we went outside and said a few words. Good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and buried a placenta. That's so it's fabulous. really interesting. Perfect. Um, I'm interested to go a little bit into, um, uh, I guess, the culture or the medical culture and how accepted lotus birth is in hospitals and how what women can do at the moment to uh, sort of be advocates for that because I was talking to a friend yesterday about writing birth plans and how if we didn't have anyone in the birth room other than us to advocate for our birth plans, like nothing in that happened. Um, because, you know, when you're birthing, you're sort of like in the zone. Mm. Um, you can't be advocating, you can't advocate for yourself when yeah. you're in labour. Yeah, exactly. And if your partner is unsure, he may not feel comfortable to approach the, um, mm. the medical people to ask questions. So quite often having uh, a doula is wonderful yep. to yep. have an advocate. Yeah. Yeah, and look, I find... With acceptance in hospitals, it really does come down to the individual that you're dealing with because some have heard of lotus birth and some have experienced it. And the mm -hmm. ones that have experienced it are generally really happy that, yeah, you're having a lotus birth, yeah? Mm -hmm. And the ones that haven't experienced it, they they don't understand it. Yep. I don't think it's part of their training, is it? Because most of them don't know what it is. They don't. No. Do no. Midwives do not learn about lotus yeah. birth. A lot of them are unaware of lotus birthing. Mm. A few may have read about it or seen it on the internet, on Facebook, where we are putting lots of information because we want the word to spread out so that all yep. women um, know about this. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the um, cultural significance. Uh, the current methods of birthing in hospitals in Australia are based on active management of labour. It's called AML, and this is a fear-inducing and very disempowering for parents. Now, if you don't have a birth plan, that's what the plan is. It's active management of labour. So you do need to have a birth plan, and quite often you need to have someone to advocate that birth plan yep. for you. Yep. Do you have any um, tips for women who need to write birth plans, do you have any advice or anything to write you know, good birth plans? Yeah, keep it short and simple. I just put in dot form what is really important to you because no one's going to stand there and read a lengthy birth plan. I had someone bring me a birth plan once and it started off with how her and her husband met and, <laughs> and I just went... You know what they're going to do with this? And I threw the birth plan. I said, I'm sorry, but they, they just don't. Like, it's a beautiful story, but they're just not going to read it. Yep. And, you know, things like if lotus birth, obviously that's something that is quite important if you're going to be lotus birthing. I'd highlight it as well so yep. it really stands out. Yep. Okay. The last birth plan that I was given um, was all in picture form. Okay. Yeah. So you can get that's that on idea. the internet now, and it's got like a little picture of... Um, uh, immediate bonding with baby, another little picture with breastfeeding, another little picture with lotus birth or, you know, whatever. So you can put it all together, create your own mm. birth plan so that when the midwife looks at it, it's quick, it's easy and she just gets the general idea just from a glance at it. Yeah. Now, if you're having a water birth, not a bad idea to uh, laminate it. Yeah. Great yeah. idea. <laughs> One of, the, one of the good things about having a birth plan, organising a birth plan, is you and your partner sit down together and you go through every single part of the birth and what you want mm. so that your partner can be your advocate yep. on the day, yep. so that your birth can be undisturbed and that the midwife does not have to interrupt your birthing process to ask you questions. Because on your birthing plan, you will have written that all questions are to be directed to either your partner 
mm. or your birth support person or your doula. Yeah. Um, so in saying